Well, good morning, Pathway. It is so good to be here this morning with you. My name is Tanner. I'm one of the youth pastors here on staff, and my prayer is that this place would be the most welcoming place that you come all week. So I want to invite you to stand up, turn around, and greet yourself to someone next to you. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Go ahead and remain standing. We're going to start this morning with a little bit of worship. Um, Psalm 148 says, Let them praise his name, for they, for he commanded and they were created. And um, creation's been praising the Lord since, since he spoke. Um, we are actually late to that party. Um, but one thing that's special about us is that we are the only part of creation that gets to choose to praise God. So I just want to invite you this morning to step into that choice and lift your songs up to him as we praise his name this morning.
justice, your mercy, revival in our city. We wait for you, Lord. Christ our King, be enthroned, be lifted high. Christ our provider. We thank you that you're rebuilding the ruins, that you're bringing revival to our cities. Lord, I'm reminded of the book of Daniel when Israel fell and Daniel and a few of his friends were taken out, taken to a land they didn't know under rule of people that saw things completely different. It would have been easy, I feel like, to have just said, okay, well, I guess I was completely wrong about everything. That maybe, maybe God isn't the greatest. Maybe he's not in control. Maybe I've, I've been stripped of everything. My identity, even to the, my very name, has been changed. And I, I feel like it would have been easy to just give up and say, okay. 
But Daniel didn't, and he served as an example of the power of God to be able to say, I, I don't understand it all, and I don't know how things are going to end up, but there's no way I'm giving up the one truth that is in my life, and that is God is in control, he's sovereign, and he reigns. And when he did that, Lord, you provided for him, you protected him, and you restored him to a position uh, that was one of the top in the land. And so we know, Lord, that when we're following you, when our eyes are on you, that all we have to do is ask for help, and you will provide it because you're faithful to provide. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this, this day, for the people in this room. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys can have a seat. Something that always fills me with so much joy and so much encouragement is hearing your voices be lifted to Christ our King. And we would actually want to give you an opportunity this morning, as we always do, to continue on and worship through our giving. And on the screen here, there's a multiple amount of ways to give. And when I think of giving, I, I often, I don't know about you, but I think of me and I think of all the things that Jesus has lavishly poured out onto my life. Answered prayers. Breath in my lungs. Things that he is over and over again saying for you how much he has given me. And I pray that this morning that would be our response back to the giver, saying all that I have is yours, Christ. My mind, my heart, my soul, my finances, all of these, I just want it to be a response of worship. And we want to give you an opportunity to do that if you feel led. And before we do that, Actually, we want to give you a couple updates. Um, we as a church have an incredible opportunity, and we partner with a number of different ministries in our city and through the churches, and, and we actually have our local missions director here who's on staff with us today, and she's going to share a little bit about what is happening in our city and what is going on. So would you welcome Aaron Ansball to the stage with us this morning? So Aaron is going to share some things about Southwick Elementary School. And I don't want to take too much of what she's going to share, but Aaron, would you walk us through, would you tell us what is the partnership, the relationship like with Southwick Elementary and Pathway? Yeah, so Pathways partnered with Southwick for many, many years. Um, Southwick is an elementary school in East Allen County Schools. It's on the southeast corner, so past New Haven and Woodburn. Um, they are situated down there. Um, and they are a K-2 to elementary school that houses 710 students. Um, so if you can imagine the number of little people running around, 60% uh, of those students are ELL learners, meaning they are English as a second language. So we have a vast number of kids that don't speak any English at all. In fact, there's currently a kindergarten classroom with four English speakers in it. Imagine teaching five-year-olds that can't speak your language. Um, they are also a school that faces a lot of economic challenges. Over 100 of their students are considered homeless, meaning they sleep on relatives' couches or in vehicles. They do not have a permanent address. Um, so the teachers there face a vast challenge with their students, but they are also also, a lot of new and young teachers, 11 of their teachers this year are brand new. Um, three long-term subs are currently in their building. And so they are facing not only a challenge of students, but as a staff, they don't have some of the longevity that some schools have. Um, and so they work really hard uh, to serve the needs of their student body and their families. And they have a lot of challenges that we as a church love to come alongside them and help them with. There's a need and also a great opportunity to jump in and serve. And for those listening with us today who are just sitting here wondering, what can I do? And would you tell us, how can Pathway people engage with Southwick? Yeah, we, there's always a need at Southwick. The needs are endless. Um, one of the things we feel passionately about is that the better we care for teachers and staff, the better their students and families are served. And so um, we do focus a lot of our attention on what's going to make a teacher's job easier. Uh, one of those things is they don't have a PTO. 
If you have a student body whose families don't speak English, it's really hard to get them all in a building and have parent involvement. So anything you do in your children's elementary schools, fall festivals, field days, um, teacher appreciation week, meals during parent-teacher conference, these are not things that are available to the teachers of Southwick. And so as a church, we try to step in and serve as a PTO in uh, a sort of PTO for their school and for their teachers. So we have a lot of opportunities that way. Um, right now, they have a desperate need to refill their storage closet uh, with 11 new teachers and kids who pretty much show up to school. I mean, they open a backpack on the first day and there's a pair of scissors and a highlighter, and that's all that student's gonna be able to bring. So those teachers are supplying a lot of their students' needs on their own. We're gonna try to refill their storage closet and get them some access to use. The list of those most needed items is in your sermon notes. Um, we will have buckets in the lobby the next few weeks. If you wanna grab a few items, drop them off. Um, one of the things on that list is $10 gift cards. These teachers, are weary and they get discouraged and there's not money to do a lot for them and so when we can hand the principal a stack of ten dollar gift cards and she can drop them in mailboxes or stop by a teacher's desk on a hard day and just encourage them a little bit it makes a huge difference in how that teacher serves the school and even for us who are listening and now we're sensing, hey, I want to jump in and now we know how to jump in. But even when we walk out of this building this morning, how can we just be praying for Southwick? Yeah, I uh, met with their principal and vice principal two weeks ago and um, they feel weary already and it's only September and they feel weary it's been a hard start they've added a hundred new students to their building um, and like I said a lot of new teachers and so I think um, that you would just pray for encouragement for them for stamina um, I think it can be easy to think that crayons and gift cards and maybe a hot meal aren't that big of a deal but we're praying that those are um, seeds that the Lord is planting in hearts of teachers we don't know their faith we don't know where they're at with the Lord but we hope that by loving them well. Um, we can have opportunities to show them the love of Jesus and maybe um, in influence their life and their eternity uh, through that. So if you would just pray for that, pray that they're encouraged and that the Lord meets their needs, whatever those are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we also have another opportunity coming up for um, us to jump in and to possibly serve with Love Your City. Aaron, would you talk us through what is Love Your City and what is our relationship like from Pathway to Love Your City? Would you tell us about that? Yeah, Love Your City is a initiative that we have partnered with NeighborLink. Um, we're going to tackle some of the projects that have been sitting in their queue for a while, um, some of them right by our neighborhoods and some throughout the city. That's going to happen from September 21st, so this coming Saturday, through the 28th. And you don't need to know how to do anything. You just have to be willing. We will have team leaders who will be on site with you. They will help you. The projects are not super involved. But if you have an hour or two, or maybe half a day, daytime, evening, weekend, that you would think, hey, I'd love to serve somebody, rake some leaves, paint a wall, whatever needs to be done. Um, there's a QR code in your sermon notes under the Love Your City section. You can sign up there. We'll send you the sign-up link this week. No commitment, but if something works with your schedule, you can jump in and help us love our city and tackle some projects for people that can't get those done themselves. Yeah. Hey, can, can we, we thank Aaron for sharing with us this morning? Yeah, so if you feel that tug in your heart and you feel, I want to jump in, I want to help with Love Your City or Southwick, please, please, I believe the Lord is inviting us into something bigger than us and to serve those around us. And so at this time, I'm going to invite those who are serving us to come forward as they pass buckets down the rows to receive offering. But as they do that, I'm going to say a quick prayer. So would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Thank you for waking us up. Lord, I pray for those who are at Southwick and in our city, Lord, that you would just bless them. Lord, that you would wrap your arms around them, that you would provide for them like we sang this morning. God, would they come to know you deeper? Would they come to trust you more and to start a relationship with those who don't know you? Lord, I pray for this offering that you would bless it, that you would send it out however you want. Father, that your will would be done the way you see it happening in your leadership and your provision. Would you meet the needs of your people through an act of faith. And God, we ask you to move this morning in our hearts. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hey, this morning now is a great time to pull out your sermon notes, pull out your Bibles, pull out your pens, because we're about to jump into week two of As For Me and My House. Good morning, Pathways. Good to see everybody here. My name is Brian Beal, and I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome everybody joining us online and, of course, up in the venue. We're glad that you are worshiping here as well. Hey, so I just want to shout out to all the men in the room because Man Day starts tomorrow. And if you are a procrastinator, it is the 11th hour, and registration is now. So you can completely ignore me for a moment, get on our website, and register for tomorrow night. In fact, we're going to be transforming the room after this service because we're going to fill this place with a bunch of tables and chairs. You join a table when you come to Man Day. You're going to get to know the group of guys around that table for the study. And our study, as we uh, jump into this session of Man Day, is called Flip the Ladder. And you're not going to know what that means, which means you need to be here. And we're going to have dinner tomorrow night. So it's a great start to Man Day. So men, 18 and over, we would love for you to be a part of this. I'll be here because there's a group of guys I love to be in these studies with. And so it would encourage you. It would challenge you. And honestly, it will transform you if you make that a priority just for the next few weeks. And a great chance to do that. Hey, we're also going to unveil something that we have available today that we're probably going to find some ways to talk more about as time goes on. But we have people that come to Pathway that don't speak English or it's not their first language. And so we now have a service. You're going to see on the screen a, a QR code that will then, if you scan with your phone, uh, you can actually access everything that I am saying back to you on your device in a streaming subtitle list of uh, everything that's happening from the stage. And you can read that in your language. And so if you scan that, maybe... Even if you're hard of hearing in English, you can access that in English. And this is a great way for us to serve people at Pathway. And so maybe you know somebody, you have a neighbor, a coworker, a friend that doesn't speak English, but if you brought them to Pathway, then they can in interact with everything happening right there on their phone. And so that's available. We'll find ways to make sure that everybody knows how to get to that website link every single weekend. And so that's available to you. I don't know how your summers went. Mine was pretty active. I had a, a slight job change here at Pathway, and it's been a fun ride just trying to figure out a new role here at Pathway among staff and everything. And uh, a couple of things that I still get to do, I still get to wrap my arms around our Bethel University extension site. We have full-time college students that are studying here at Pathway through Bethel University. And then I still get to connect with and lead inside of our Thrive Financial Ministry. And I want to talk about two things coming up with our Thrive Ministry that I'd love for you to know about. One, it's on your sermon notes. There's a QR code that talks about or connects to our Financial Peace University class. And we are launching our next one September 26th. It is five weeks long. And you're thinking to yourself, I've heard about that. I thought it was longer. It is. It's nine weeks long, but we're going to do it in five weeks and still go through all the content. So we would love for you, if you have never done this before, to sign up. Uh, it's $25 per person or couple uh, because you share a workbook. And that's why that cost doesn't change. There's kid care available for an additional fee. If you grow graduate from Financial Peace University, we will give you a full refund of whatever you paid because we want to help you launch into financial peace. So you have nothing to lose, everything to gain, including peace and wisdom in your finances. So you can register right there in your handout. The second thing coming up is we began a brand new partnership this year with an organization called Financial Planning Ministries. And that sounds a lot like financial peace, but it's completely different. Financial Planning Ministry is an organization that comes in and, and here at Pathway that will help you write a will or a trust for you and your family at no out-of-pocket cost to you. And so this is something that we are very excited about. We've already had them come out a couple of times, but now that you're hearing this announcement, and if you're hearing this online, you are welcome and invited to join us in this. So the next one coming up is this Saturday, uh, Saturday, September 21st. We'll meet here in the building, and there's another uh, webinar online on Monday night, September 23rd. And you don't have to go to both. You just go to one, and maybe if you're married, just one spouse goes to one of those, and that gets you in the door. And I can tell you that 90-minute moment where you're going to learn about what 
what is a will? What is a trust? Why do I need this? What are the differences? What is this all about? It is so informative and so helpful. And I would, uh, I've, I've had to do these several times because of our relationship with them now. And I learn something new every time I get into those presentations. I would highly recommend you come because they just make the process so straightforward. And the great thing is if you stay at Pathway, you stay connected to us, as your life changes, you can update your will or trust with Financial Planning Ministries at no out-of-pocket cost to you. And that's why we love this organization. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. Scan your QR code down there and let us know that you're coming and we'll get you that information coming. So, all right. The reason why we do those two things, financial peace class, financial planning, is because we want to give you and your household a foundation to live on, which is the heart of this series that we're in called As For Me and My House. We began last week with a passage from Joshua 24, verse 15. It's going to be on the screen. I want to just revisit this because this is where we started with Pastor Ron last week. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we started there, and then he took us into Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we talked about how our lives are the example, how our lives impact and imprint on our children with the way that we interact with faith, the way that we walk out our relationship with Jesus. It affects our children. And I want to continue a disclaimer that Pastor Ron gave us last week, which is you may have no children, and you think this doesn't apply to me. You, you may not want children, and you think this doesn't apply to me. This is not at all why we're doing this. You have a human relationship. You need this series. So this is in the context of parent-child relationship, but you can apply these principles to any relationship that matters to you. I'm an adult son of a mom, and so this applies to me because my mom is still around, right? So I can use these principles in a lot of different areas. So as we jump into this, just know you can apply this. And so I'm going to read actually today, just at the beginning, a passage that we know it's, it's been, you know, kind of taught a lot. We've seen this in the scriptures. It's in Matthew 18, verse 23. So if you have your own Bibles, turn there. I'm going to read it on the screen, but in Matthew 18, verse 23, I want to actually do something with this this story. I actually want to create a twist that'll create tension, and I'm going to do it on purpose. So let's read this together. Matthew 18, verse 23 says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with the servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. All right, that's a big number. You need to know that in the Roman numeral system, 10,000 was the largest number they knew. So Jesus is using the largest number that they know. And, and bags of gold, the Greek there is a talent. And so that was the largest amount of currency you could use as a word. So Jesus is using the largest number with the largest amount of currency. Today in our money, this would be about a billion dollars. So this guy owed his king a billion dollars, was brought to him, and it continues since he was not able to pay the master order that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt, which would never cover this debt. He didn't own that much. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything, which would never happen. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Everybody hearing this story from Jesus, their jaws would have opened because Nobody does that. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. In our currency, that'd be about $10,000. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Same words spoken as before, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in and he said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to jailers to be tortured till he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you, Jesus says, unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. And so just with that story, I want you to put yourself in the story. I want you to just think about being that first servant, the one whose billion-dollar debt was forgiven. 
Understand that if you follow Jesus and you place your trust in him and you, you, you live your life for him, that's what he's done for you. He's forgiven a billion dollar debt that you owed and made it right. Not because you deserved it, because you didn't. Not because you earned it, because you couldn't. I couldn't either. There's nothing that I could have done to make that happen. And Jesus didn't do this because of who I am. He did it because of who he is. That's why he did this. This entire story, this concept, is the purest definition that I can give you of grace. This is grace at work in us. You have been forgiven a debt you didn't deserve. Now, I want you, since you're in the story, I want you to imagine that if you have a child or you have children, I want you to put them in the story as the second servant in the story. I want you to think about maybe for a moment if at some point they have sinned against you, they've made a mistake, they have failed. What's your response to them? Do you respond with harsh words? instill punishment that just makes them, makes them know that you hurt me and I want you to feel this punishment? Or does the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus from the king flow from you to your child? Anybody feeling tension yet? <laughs> That's the goal. Let's begin to resolve the tension. The title of this message is really simple, The Necessity of Grace. If you have one human relationship, that relationship needs grace. If you have a child or children, those relationships need grace. We need this. So I want to give you a big idea that will begin to draw out some of this tension away from us. And let's look at this together. My acceptance of grace is confirmed by my gifting of grace to other people. My acceptance of grace is confirmed by my gifting of grace to others. See, the requirement in this is that if you do not give grace to others, you will never fully receive grace from God. You'll never fully understand grace unless you give it away. Now, we have relationships, and some of us are parents, and we have kids, and some of us are, are children, and we have parents. So I want to talk about how we build relationships on grace, and I want to give you four ways in which we build relationships on grace. And here's the first one that I want to give you, which is simply find guardrails that protect freedom. Find guardrails that protect freedom. The irony of this statement would be that, well, you know, if you have no guardrails, if you have no boundaries, now we're free. Now I have freedom. Now I can choose to do whatever I want. That's not actually how it works. When we put guardrails around something, then you have freedom with whatever is inside of there. And so, you know, when we drive in the mountains, nobody gets offended that there's a guardrail on the side of the highway or the road as we take blind curves. We are thankful for that guardrail because it's protecting us from a danger we don't want to encounter, which is driving off the cliff. So the guardrail is there for a reason, and we have freedom because the guardrail is there. So grace, when grace enters into a relationship, you can hit the guardrail. So I don't know if anybody in here ever has hit a guardrail, but if you hit a guardrail with your actual car, you will cause damage. But it is less damage than the alternative, which is whatever is on the other side of the guardrail, which is probably a cliff. It would cause life-altering damage or death if that guardrail wasn't there. So it is okay if our kids hit the guardrail, because then we can teach them. Then we can have a deeper conversation. There's a scripture I want to share with you from Galatians 5.13 that Paul writes, and he just simply says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Whenever Paul talks about the flesh, he means our sinful nature. It's the side of us that, that goes to the left or the right. It's the one that's drawn into sin. It's the one that's drawn in to addictions and all the things that take us away from what God wants for us. So in your freedom, don't feed your flesh. You build guardrails around that. So what are examples of guardrails? What are ways in which we can do that as parents? Let me give you just a couple that my wife and I have engaged. You know, our kids, you know, when we give them a, a piece of technology, and so each of our kids have had the opportunity to have a phone, 
And so we have given our kids a phone, but we've said on day one, here's how this thing is set up. There is built-in accountability and filtering on that phone. We have put guardrails around this phone because we would be horrible parents if we just said, here, take this, look up whatever you want, consume whatever you want, go explore whatever your heart desires. It would be horrible for doing that. Not only that, but we put limits around social media. It's because my wife and I have done that as well. And so our kids have guardrails around that. And you can't show me a study that says, because there are no studies that say that unlimited access to social media makes kids' lives better. It doesn't. It ruins their hearts and their souls. So we've built guardrails around that. Uh, and when it comes to sports and extracurricular activities, we've allowed our children to, to jump in whatever activities, whatever things that they want to participate in. We want our kids in those environments. So we build guardrails. Our, our guardrails are actually around Wednesday nights. We have told our children that on Wednesday nights, their time of worship and teaching and community is here at Pathway. And so the guardrail is if school ever suffers, we're going to take away those extracurriculars, those sports, those things that are obviously making you too busy because we never say, well, hey, don't go to church tonight because you got too much work to do. No, they're here on Wednesday nights because this is important. So we put guardrails around important things and we say, this is where you get connected. This is where you worship. This is where you hear teaching that speaks to you. The Holy Spirit is here, therefore you're here. And we put guardrails around the other things so that this doesn't suffer. Uh, when it comes to finances, uh, my wife and I decided when our kids were young, at, at five years of age, we've allowed our children to interact with money. We want them to. We want them to work and have tasks that allow them to earn money because we want them to have this interaction. We want them to be familiar with it. And so when, when they were five, obviously it was small, but as they've gotten older, we've been able to expand that. And we teach our kids about giving, saving, and spending in that order with that priority because it's what we're doing. Their parents are doing that. And so what happens then in the midst of it is we want our children to make financial mistakes because if they make mistakes as kids, they'll learn the reasons and they won't make them as adults or they won't make the mistakes that ruin their lives as adults. And so we teach them now when they're young. The last one is on uh, the issue of driving and cars. We have a really simple guardrail. We own the car, my wife and I. We bought a car. We permit our teenagers to drive it. And if we need to correct behavior, they can call a friend or ride the bus. That's how we handle it. It's a really simple guardrail around the car. Number two, second way that we build relationships on grace is that we allow consequences that lead to wisdom. We allow consequences that lead to wisdom. As parents, we always have the opportunity to help our children when they fail, or we can just hurt them with punishment. I think we would all agree that we would rather help our children in failure. But you need to realize that when you encounter your child that they've made a mistake, if they have sinned against you, if they have failed in some way, your first words are explosive, no matter what you do. Let me explain why. One of the ways in which this can happen is you can just toss a stick of dynamite on them and just blow the whole thing up. I don't need to share stories on this because I think you know what this looks like because this happened to me as a kid. I have unfortunately done this as a parent because I'm not perfect. And I know you know these things. We can just drop sticks of dynamite on our kids and just blow it all up. Or, you know, inside of an engine, an internal combustion engine, there's the mixture of gas, heat, and oxygen, and it creates an explosion. It actually propels the car forward. We can explode like that in such a way that tells our children that we believe in them, that we're behind them, that we actually see where they can learn wisdom on this. Now, there's still a consequence. I'm not saying you don't do consequences. We do consequences, but the consequences lead to wisdom. Because we want our children to leave our home filled with wisdom one day. We want them to see what God has been teaching them. So uh, scripture that comes out of this is Proverbs 19.20, New Living Translation, has a great translation for this. But get all the advice and instruction you can so you can be wise the rest of your life. That's what we want for our kids. And we have to lead that for them. So the story that, that we have in our family, I was talking to our uh, second oldest son, Gideon, 
last week and preparing for this message. And I said, hey, did you ever have a moment where you did something, you knew it was wrong, like you knew you were going to get in trouble, but instead of getting like the dynamite, there was something else that happened? He said, yeah. Remember that one day in the summer? And I was like, oh yeah, I remember that day. So our son was in middle school and uh, I remember where I was sitting, I was working on something. I said, hey, um, show me your spending envelope. And he said, uh, yeah, I can, uh, it's, it's empty. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's his envelope to manage. It's the money that he's earned, so it's his money, so it's okay. I said, why is it empty? He said, well, you know, we have a Starbucks behind our house and restaurants nearby, and he'd been going there with his buddies and spent all of his spending envelope. I said, okay, great. Well, let me see your savings envelope. And then his head dropped, and I was like, show me your, spend, your savings envelope. Bring it to me. And he did. It was empty. I said, where's the money in here? So, well, when the money ran out of the spending envelope, I went to that envelope, and I kept going to Starbucks and restaurants with my buddies and just wanted to, you know, keep going to those things. I was like, oh, man, this is not good. And he thought he was going to get the dynamite, that we were just going to blow up on him. So my wife and I kind of stepped aside for a moment. We talked, and we said, no, he needs to learn. He needs to learn this lesson. So what we did was we said, hey, give us your spending envelope. So we couldn't have it then. We put it away. I said, okay, you got to keep earning money. You got to keep doing the things that you're doing. You got you to gotta do this. And you're going to do your giving 10%. And you're going to put 90% in savings until you recoup that number. And when you do, then we'll give you back your spending envelope. So we did. It took him a while. We want him to learn now the importance of having a savings account. Because when things happen in life when you're an adult and you have that, you don't end up having emergencies. You just pay for it and you move on. And we want him to learn that now. And that's what we're doing. Consequences lead to wisdom. Number three, embrace God's providence over my providence. Embrace God's providence over my providence. Now, understand that this is different when you have toddlers and you have a 20-year-old. So there are things that you're going to lead your little ones through that you're going to do differently than when they're 20. You shouldn't parent a 20-year-old the way you parent a toddler Please hear me say that out loud so that everyone knows. Don't do that. All right. Now, let's talk about what providence is, because I think this is really important. This is a really important theological definition. And this is, this is an academic one, uh, definition. So just understand, this is what we mean when we say that God is providential. Providence is the continuous activity of God in his creation by which he preserves and governs. Providence affirms God's absolute lordship over his creation. So he's over creation, and it confirms the dependence of all creation on the creator. So it's a two-way street. God is Lord, and we depend on him. It is the denial of the idea that the universe is governed by chance or fate. If someone says, good luck, no, I don't need it. God's in control. There's no such thing as luck. This is God. God is, God is over me. He is over this. I'm good. He's providential. So that's providence. Now, the way that we can explain human providence or when we say as parents, it's my providence that my kids live by, that's helicopter parenting. Anybody familiar with this term? Helicopter parenting? It's the idea that you hover over your kids in such a way that you are aware of everything they're doing. And technology now has made this so simple for us as parents to be able to see everything our kids are doing because it's all about their device. It's all about what they're doing and where they're at. And so helicopter parenting is an unbelievable amount of knowledge and awareness about what our kids are doing. And I thought this week, that's probably the worst form of it. There's nothing worse out there. And then I Googled it and I found out, oh, we have found new ways to make it worse. So there's helicopter parents. So you guys are familiar with that term. But there's another term called lawnmower parents. And I was like, what is a lawnmower parent? This is what it means. A lawnmower parent mows a clear, well-groomed path ahead of their child, removing every obstacle and, and the weeds of adversity and struggle. That's a lawnmower parent. Then there's a snowplow parent. They're more aggressive than lawnmower parents. They clear every obstacle that might make their child feel the emotions of failure, frustration, and humiliation. Then there's the bulldozer parent, which is the more intimidating snowplow parent. They're just intimidating to everybody, and they are clearing the way for their kids. And then there's the jellyfish parent, which was new to me. These parents have few rules and no expectations. They give in to avoid confrontation. They lack authority and are are generally overly permissive with their kids. None of these are good. Grace informs parenting. Grace informed parenting teaches us 
our kids should do hard things. We should let our kids do hard things. A- anecdotally, there was a college pastor who remarked to an author that he was having a hard time getting college students who are adults, by the way, just so we're all clear, because in college, you're an adult. College students weren't allowed to go on college short-term missions trips because their parents wouldn't allow it because they had no control over the trip. And this is happening in our culture, in our society. And mission trips, short-term mission trips are hard things. There's the hard thing of money cost. There's the hard thing of time away from school, away from work, away from sports. There's the hard thing of just being able to leave your culture and be completely immersed in something different from everything, to be removed from every comfort that you know. But you know and I know that when we do that, when we follow God into different parts of the world for a short trip, we actually begin to build up a deeper reservoir of reliance on God, of his providence, and then we have deeper reservoirs of confidence and hope in us. And that's why our kids should do hard things. This is something that, I mean, if you can capture this and you can see this for your kids, you're going to come to the point where it, it is okay to be responsible for your little ones. Totally okay with that. When they are young and when they are small, you are responsible for them. But there comes a point when you are now responsible to them. It is different. And as your kids grow, you've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to let go and trust that God knows what he's doing. I mean, this is really important. I'm just going to share a verse from Proverbs 5.21, which simply says, For your ways are, full, are in full view of the Lord. He examines all your paths. He is really good at this. He knows what he's doing. The last way we build relationships on grace is this statement here. Explore the root before the fruit. Explore the root before the fruit. And this one gets a little interesting because as parents, we do a really good job of reacting to when our children make mistakes, when they fail, when they sin, when they, when they have these, these moments, and we react to the action, which is really the fruit, instead of looking at the why, the heart, the root of what happened, the root of what informed that action or whatever informed that moment in our child's life. Relationships built on grace reveal that when fruit is revealed, we get into the root. And when grace touches the fruit, I'm sorry, when grace touches the root, it transforms the fruit. It changes everything from the inside out. This happened in our our family recently when one of our sons, uh, we were in public and we were talking and he made a comment. He quoted me. He said, dad, you said this once. And I said, I just immediately reacted to the fruit. And I wanted to just say, you're wrong. I never said that. That's completely unlike anything I would ever say to you. But we were in public. So I said, hey, we need to get home. We got to have a deeper conversation on this. So we did. We got home. We had a much deeper conversation. When we went into the heart, my wife and I found out that there were two lies that he believed about me, things that he had thought I'd said. And we called out those lies in the heart and replaced them with truth so that he knew exactly how I felt about him, so that he knew exactly what I needed him to know about me. And that's heart-level work. That's root-level work. I'm not worried about the fruit. I'm worried about the root so that we can get there. If we change the root, the fruit comes along with it. And the passage that speaks to this is Luke 6, 45. A good man brings the good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings the evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I want to put all four of these statements up on the screen. and I know as parents, we can feel really defeated. I'm not doing anything as well. These are, these are hard concepts. These are tough to live by. I totally get it. In preparation for this series, a couple of us, we were reading through some books, and one of the books that I read uh, that Pastor Ron gave me was called Parenting with Hope by Melissa Kruger. And in a chapter on grace, she talked about what this is like for parents. I want to give you this statement, this quote, because I want it to be an encouragement to you. She writes, so if you find yourself regularly yelling at your teen, and, and maybe you don't have a teenager, maybe it's a child, a toddler, an older adult child, maybe it's just your friend, coworker, neighbor, or teammate, a relationship where you just have a lot of dysfunction. Insert that person in this statement. But if you find yourself regularly yelling at your teen and being impatient with their failures, harsh in your demeanor, unkind with your words, don't blame those responses on your teen. Instead, go to the Lord, beg his forgiveness, ask him to change you, and then repent before your teenager. 
one of the hardest things we will ever do as parents. Own your mistakes. Don't excuse your behavior because your teen's behavior. Instead, acknowledge your own need of grace. That's what we need in these relationships. So you put back the, the four back up there. We want you to see these four. I want to make just one more point out of this, and we're going to close. As you look at these four, you could live these out, and they can become second nature, but here's why. When you look at these four statements, we actually can begin to see that God does this in us. God, our Father, does this to his children who are us, that he gives us guardrails that protect our own freedom, that when we mess up, God gives us consequences that lead to wisdom, right? Some of your biggest failures you can teach people about. Here's what I learned when I failed. We have an understanding that God is providential. We just sang the worship song, the Lord will provide. Will he? If you really believe that, then you understand God's providence over you. And God explores the root before the fruit. When we mess up and we have things in our life, it is God who does the heart surgery in us. That's what he's doing. And so these four are things that we already see in our own life, which means we can give them away. But here's the thing. If you can't give these away, the question I'd ask you is, have you ever encountered and embraced the grace that Jesus has for you? And if you haven't, you can't do this. You first need to know that your debt has been forgiven. Now you can give it away. So which one of these needs your focus this week? Which one of these do your kids need to see you interact with this week? And I would say, go do it. Don't waste any time. Go after it. God wants to do work in you. And I want you to be defeated. I don't want you to feel defeated. I want you to feel like this is a, a mountain I can't climb. You absolutely can. And I want to show you how. I want to quote uh, a prayer that Paul has in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. As I read this, I want you to stand where you're at. If up in the venue, I want you to stand where you're at. I want to close with this. Because I want you to see this message, and I want you to hear these words read over you. Because this is not work you do on your own. This is not something that parents can ever figure out on their own. Any dysfunctional relationship that you have in your life, you will never, ever be able to figure this out unless you understand this prayer. Now to him who is able... This is not impossible for God. Not only is it not impossible, but he is able to do it. He is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power. This is not about your will, your knowledge, whatever you bring into the relationship has nothing to do with you. It is all about his power and it's not external. It is at work within us. It's already in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, not one generation that we're concerned about. His eyes are on every generation forever and ever. Amen. And this is what Jesus wants to do in you. This is what God wants to do in you. You don't ever do any of this work by yourself. And not only that, but you are concerned. I am concerned about one generation. It's the one that comes after me. But when God's power is at work in us, we don't just change one generation. We change many generations because of what he's doing through us. And so that's where we're at. And that's what you have access to right now. I want to pray over you as we close. Heavenly Father, we need you in so many tangible ways. We are that servant whose debt has been forgiven. But we go outside. We go into our workplaces, into our homes. We go into other, other parts of our life. And we just don't carry that forgiveness, that, that grace with us. But we need to remember what we have been forgiven of as we interact with people. I pray, God, that our community, when they hear the words Pathway Community Church, they don't think of a building, they don't think of a location, but they think of the people they interact with, the people who are so filled with grace, they can't wait to just send that grace out of them to the people around them, that they have been shown mercy, that they have been forgiven by the people around them who love you. And God, may we be a people that understand this as parents that our kids would be raised understanding that we are working for their future, that we are here listening to wisdom about what you're doing, and it is not our will, but it is your power at work in us. And we want to see them grow in wisdom and grace. We want to see them protected and moving forward as they do the same for their peers and their future children. Father, thank you that we get to be here, that we get to do this work, to see you work through us. 
Thank you, Jesus. We thank you and pray in your name. Amen. Amen. If you're new to Pathway, we'd love for you to stop by guest services. And uh, if you need prayer, come forward. We'd love to pray over you. Have a wonderful day.